I'm Carmen Lundy. Thank you for tuning in to Jazz Speaks Art, presented by Aphrasia Productions. Here's what's new. A new video series, Living the Jazz Life with Rhonda Hamilton, where Rhonda speaks to jazz veterans about the art of living the jazz life. Welcome to Living the Jazz Life. I'm Rhonda Hamilton, and our guest today is one of the most sought after and versatile drummers in jazz for many, many years. He's played in so many different settings, a wide variety of music with everyone from Sonny Rollins to Sting to Willie Nelson to John Hendricks. He's also a played with legends like, uh, oh, Benny Golson and Art Farmer and their jazz tet and with uh, some of these stellar former Basieites, the great saxophonist composers and arrangers, Frank Foster and Frank West. He was a part of uh, Steve Coleman's Five Elements Band, and uh, he's received also uh, a lot of recognition for his work. He's enjoyed associations with Dave Holland and Hammett Blewett, but I think certainly best known for the 18 years that he spent as a member of the band on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. So we are so pleased to have as our guest today, Mr. Marvin Smitty Smith. Oh, thank you, Rhonda. It is so great to see you. Welcome to Los Angeles. Yes, Because I haven't you. seen you since you made the, the transition uh -huh. out here. So yes. it's so great to see you after all this time in our New York days. Yes, so this, yes. is, this is a great homecoming. Well, a lot, a lot of history. Yeah, I feel like it's a homecoming, and yeah. it's, it's wonderful to, to know that you're here, and I, I'm fortunate to have so many people that I've known for many years like you yeah. who are, you know, part of this whole community here yeah, in beautiful. Los Angeles. It's been beautiful. But, you know, having that steady gig on mm. the Tonight Show oh, is boy. something that a lot of drummers or musicians, period, would love to have. And of course, you did have a relationship with the music director, uh, Kevin, Kevin Eubanks. Eubanks. Yeah. He was a friend of yours going back to your back days to at Berkeley. College, yeah, Berkeley yeah. College. But music. this, you didn't get that gig because of friendship. You have to have certain qualities. And what is necessary to get a gig like that? Well, well, the, yeah, especially to do a TV TV show, right. uh, because it, there's reading, music reading required. So, and and it's also like some split second. Uh, timing because television is like, you know, they, they, you know, announce the skit and then they want like some, you know, music to play to introduce the comedy bit or whatever. Right. So it's just like really being able to take direction and really being able to nail things right second, you know, split second. It's like, and now ladies and gentlemen, blah, 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 bah, you know, whatever it is, you know, so, so a level of alertness and awareness. And also the, the the ability to play, you know, a lot of different styles because they might want something, you know, they might want like, you know, a pop thing or a rock thing or, they, you know, they, they might want some jazz or they want something, you know, kind of campy and show biz kind of thing. And so you just have to have a good sensibility and understanding of what those styles are. Mm -hmm. So you have to have that in your vocabulary so you're able to execute it. So th those qualities you got to have. And just a level of professionalism, you know, show up on time, you know, be able to take direction, you know, and just have a great spirit going into whatever it is you have to do, you know, so those things were, you know, I'm fortunate that Kevin, you know, saw those qualities in me and said, hey, bro, I'll never forget it, because when he called me, um, it was a Friday night at midnight. And I was in the recording studio doing a demo, and and I was in, I was living in New York, and my my ex wife my wife at the time, I get a phone call from her. She says, "Hey, you know Kevin called you. It's really important, so you need to call him back." And this is midnight Friday night. So, hey, Kev, what's what, what's up? What's going on? He said, "Hey, man, hey, it's about to go down, man. I'm taking over as MD for the Tonight Show." And I, I need you to do this with me. I was like, okay, cool, bro. He said, look, I got, a, I got a ticket waiting for you at United Airlines, you know, Sunday morning, first thing. You fly out here, man, because we got a show on Monday. I was like, Sunday? Sunday? I was like, okay, all right. So, you know, I went home that night. I went home and packed up whatever I could pack and made sure I had my cymbals and drumsticks and... 
Kim, you know. Just, you were living in New York at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. That's why it was so late when he called you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it was it was wild, uh -huh. but uh, it was great. It was well, and that's experience. part of it too, to be able to react like that, to yeah. set the moment at moments' notice, and to pay attention all the right. time too. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I just remember that first week on the show, and I, you know, because I was just looking around the studio, and I'm like, wow, man, I can't even believe I'm here. I mean, I remember when I was a kid. You know, and I would stay up late to watch Johnny Carson, and I would see Ed Shaughnessy play drums, and sometimes Louis Belson would sub, and you know, but I was this kid, and I was just thinking that was the coolest thing to be playing music on a TV show, you know, and I had no intention or no real vision to say, okay, that's what I really want to do. I wasn't even thinking about that. I was just, hey, I just want to play music, but the opportunity presented itself, and now here I am, and I'm just like. Wow, man, I can't even believe I'm yeah. here. So a dream that you didn't have came true. Right, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It, you know, the blessing was there. So I took mm -hmm. it, you know. And you were great. ready. You were prepared for it. Yeah. It was a great thing. Yeah, which, that, that was beautiful. Uh -huh. Yeah, so. And how did that experience uh, in, enhance your artistry in any way? Well, see, see, you know, that's the thing, Rhonda, that, that you know, a lot of jazz musicians, a lot of musicians and, you know, cats would be like, yeah, man, man, you're doing that TV show, man. Yeah, man, 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 you don't get to stretch out and play, you know, man, you know, man, that, 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 that seemed like a drag. And then, as soon as they finish saying that, hey, man, if, if there's an opening, man, you know, like, hook up your boy, you right? You know, so it's like, yeah. Hey, look, it's a nice gig. You can make some nice money. You can have a nice lifestyle. It's, hey, look, those trappings are nice, you know, but for me, the thing was, okay, the, it, it, it was like, okay. So now I'm in this situation where I'm in, I'm, I'm, I'm in the band, but as far as the band's concerned, we are the third option in the context of a television show because the first option, obviously, is the host. The second option is the guests, or are the guests that come on the show. And then the third option is us, is the band, you know, because for the studio audience, during the commercial breaks, we would play for the studio audience. So just to keep them hyped, keep them entertained, you know, so we're, we're the third option, you know. So that was our function within the context of the show. So now you have to have you have to have the sensibilities and the, and the understanding to know where, where, you know, what your position, as they say, play your position. Right. So, like I say, for for some cats, you know, they would feel that working on a television show would be a detriment to their growth, to their musical growth. Because, they, well, I can't, you know, it's not like I'm at the Village Vanguard, man, I can't stretch out and play and get, get to my stuff, right? And, you know, it's just like we're just playing, like, during commercial breaks for about three and a half minutes, five times in the show. You know, man, that would be a drag, you know? But so now you're already setting a preconception on what that situation is instead of taking the situation for what it is and finding the musicality that you can put into it, into that context. So that's what I did. I said, hey, I'm going to still make some music. I'm going to make the best music I can make within this context. Right, and it's all, it's all good music. And it's all good music. And, and, and I learned some very valuable things from working on a television show. You know, because, you know, one of the things I learned is that, like, like when you're in a club and you're playing a gig in a club, you have so much time to let things develop at a at a long much longer pace on a television show you know when you just got that commercial break you going in the commercial it you know like Leno would say all right we'll be back we'll be right back with so and so right after this and so now we got to hit that music from the from the first note we have to project the 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 energy and the impact from the very first note, not just to the studio audience, but to the people watching at home. We got to convey our energy of like, yeah, we're rocking and rolling or we're grooving or we're swinging, whatever it is from that very first note. We have to project that because we only got like about five seconds of time where they hear the band before it goes out to commercial. So we have to establish our, 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 our you know, intent right from the very first note and project that energy and project that spirit right right then so that the audience whether they're at home or they were in the studio 
they can feel that right off the bat. Well, you know, that kind of reminds me about how it used to be in the recording industry, you know, where songs were like two minutes long, two and a half minutes two and a half long, long. Yeah. and that was it. And you had to get, you know, everything that you wanted to express and the best of what you could express in that limited amount of time, which is really, you know, something that teaches you something. It's, 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 uh, it's an art that you have to learn. You don't have the luxury of, of stretching out. Like right, well, and that's an art. Yeah, and I'm glad you touched on that because, like, you know, how, how I really, how the music really captured me was, you know, I started formal training at three, but it was when I was five years old. And my dad was a music aficionado. He played little drums on the side, he, you know, but he was just really into the music. But when I was five years old, uh, my dad's collection, I, there was this Charlie Parker record and he played, uh, uh, it was, uh, I remember, I think the record might've been Swedish Schnapps or one of those, one of those. And, um, he played, uh, 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 confirmation. And so, you know, after bird, you know, played his solo and I think Al Haig was playing, you know, and so he played up to like, he played like the first couple of a sections. And then there was the, there was the bridge of the song, which was eight bars long. And Max played the solo for eight bars, and then Charlie Parker came in on the bridge and, fin and finished the song out. And in, uh, in those eight bars that Max Roach played the solo, it really like struck me because there was it was so much music in those eight bars of a drum solo. It was to me it was just as impactful as the solo that Charlie Parker played. And I was like, okay, that's what I want to get to. I want to get to that. Play sounding just as musical on the drums as anybody else on a horn or, or piano or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's where it really struck me. And to just play eight bars and to make a statement, you know, now we got the, you know, like I've been in LA 25 years now and I, and I play local gigs and, you know, some youngins come, horn players, you know, he comes sit in and they're just playing chorus after chorus after chorus. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, okay. Guys, guys, okay. You know, it's like, you got to tell a story. Yes. You know, yeah. and, 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 you know, it, it, yeah, I, I could go in the whole rent, you know, and I don't want to sound like the curmudgeonous old guy, get off my lawn guy. But, you know, it's just like, they, they just haven't learned how to, you know, make their statements concise and impactful and really tell a story, you know, like concise. Right. And, and, and to just make their point and just move on out the way. Well, you know, mentors are, are so important when you're developing as an artist. And, and fortunately, you came up in a time where you had access to, to some of these great people. Because traditionally in jazz, you, you learned it was like an apprenticeship. You know, you had the opportunity to uh, hear, but also have personal experiences with the masters of the past, and you had right. the opportunity to engage with a lot of those people during your your career. So, Absolutely. who were some of your most important mentors? Oh, oh man, wow. Well, you know, I, I could go all the way back when I when I first started. So, so I'll 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 try to be brief about it. But when I started formal training, uh, like my first lesson, my dad tried to teach me, but the father son relationship way too intense and way too yeah. close. And so he pawned me off to a buddy of his when I was five. And it was this drummer named Charlie Williams. And he made an indelible impression on me because even, even when I was that young, I saw, I saw Charlie Williams, I saw him play, like he played piano trio, or he played quartet or quintet with a couple horns. He played big band. He played, he actually played with a double bass drum setup, you know, like a larger drum kit, double bass drum setup, and was just swinging and just, you know, and he played like a little, you know, standard jazz bebop kit. And he, did, he but he was just so versatile, and it made such an indelible impression on me from, you know, from five years old. So I studied with him for about a year and a half, and then he moved. You know, I'm from Waukegan, Illinois, just north of Chicago, born and raised. So after I studied with him for a year and a half, he moved away to New Jersey, and I caught up with him years later in the like the mid late 80s you know when i was in new york and then the next guy i studied with was a guy named donald taylor and he was just very instrumental to me yeah i studied with him for 10 years and he was the kind of guy that he would just say okay here i got some records here you know max roach and art blakey you know elvin jones philly joe jones i was like i got a few records so he would give me like about five records and he'd say okay take these home 
and come back next week and show me what you got. You know, show me what you learned from. So, you know, I go home and shed, listen to these records, come back the next week. Oh, hey, well, like on this record, on this tune, you know, Max did this and this, and I heard this, you know. So he saw that I was really like into doing the homework. Mm -hmm. And so he would just keep feeding me, you know, and just like, so, so that was just a great relationship. And then the last two years, you know, my junior and senior year in high school, uh, when I started doing gigs in the city in Chicago, uh, I, I studied with this drummer named Marshall Thompson, and he was like a Chicago legend, and he was great. He was just he just had like this buttery smooth, you know, swing feel. He played brushes real beautiful, and so I studied with him. So I would take the train from Waukegan, like the Chicago and Northwestern train. So I take the train down to Union Station in Chicago and get off and just go right in the loop on Wabash Avenue and go to this place called Drums Limited. It was on the sixth floor and I would take my lessons. It was seven bucks a lesson. <laughs> so I studied with Marshall for two years. So you those were get a cup of coffee for that. Right, right. right. <laughs> you know, so I studied. So those were my main uh, mentors, you know, studying the drums. And then... I went to Berkeley College of Music, 79, and that's how I met Branford Marcellus, uh, you know, Donald Harrison, uh, Greg Osby, Wallace Roney, uh, Jean Toussaint. Uh, so we were all in school at that time. And uh, Jeff Watts, Tane. Uh, so we were all in school at the time. And the, the people that were out of the school but were still in Boston doing gigs, it was Kevin Eubanks, Victor Bailey, Bobby Broom, <laughs> you know, so it was just a whole slew of folks, uh, Tommy Campbell, big bro, you know, he, so, you know, it was just a whole slew of people who I met that were like-minded and, oh, they're into the music too, so we would just have a great time. I got a phone call from one of the piano teachers at Berkeley College, uh, Alex Ulanovsky, and he was playing with John Hendricks, so we, he had a gig up in, our, up in Vermont. And so he said, well, look, Alan Dawson was going to do the gig, but he couldn't make it at the last minute. So he had to bow out. He said, would you be interested in doing the gig? I was like, sure. You know, John Hendricks, Lambert Hendricks, Ross, he's a legend, right? So I ended up doing the gig. <laughs> I never forget. I was 19. So if you can imagine, people, I'm 19 years old and I'm this skinny guy <laughs> with a crooked afro. So... So I remember going to going into the club. So I'm rolling my drums in and I'm setting them up. And John Hendricks comes in. And so he, you know, he just turns over and he sees this little scrawny kid setting up drums. He was like, hey kid, how you doing? I was like, oh, hello, hello, Mr. Hendricks. He, he said, yeah, okay, where's the drummer? I said, well, well, I'm the drummer. And he was like, wait, wait, you're the drummer? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm ready, yeah, I'm ready to do the gig, Mr. Hendricks. You know, it's like setting up. So he goes to Alex, Alex Ulanovsky and he goes, I don't know, man. This little kid, man, like, you know, is, can he play? You know, Alex was, you know, Alex, to his credit, Alex was like, look, this is, this, this kid can play. You know, you won't be disappointed. So, so I did the week. And then after, after the week, he, he said, you know, he said, hey, you know, you want to come to New York with me? And I was just freaked out. You know, I called my parents every day for a week. Like, what should I, what should I do? What should I do? My mom wanted me to stay in school. And my dad, you know, being the, wanting to be the musician, he was like, man, you get on that opportunity. Jump on that, man. So, so I went to New York. So that was kind of the beginning of your that career. That was the beginning, yeah. Off. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so John Hendricks, obviously, he was a mentor. Mm -hmm. He looked out for me. So I, I give him all the credit in the world. And then I acclimated myself on the scene. And so people like Rufus Reed, he looked out for me. Uh, you know, uh, uh, John Hicks, you know, big brother, he was so cool. Mm -hmm. And um, and then Bobby Watson, oh, mm -hmm. uh, big brother, looked out for me, man. I, I used to crash when he and his wife Pam, they used to live up on Columbus Avenue on the Upper West Side. And it was that. a studio apartment. Yeah. And sometimes I would just crash on their floor overnight because he would just show me like, Composition, you know, like I'd ask him about, well, how did you get about, you know, because he wrote, he wrote and has written some, you know, beautiful tunes, which I consider jazz classics. So I would ask him like, well, okay, what was your approach on, you know, coming up with this tune? So he would just show me like, you know, on the piano, okay, well, here's the melody, and I just tried to develop this and blah, and he would let me crash on his floor in his studio. It was a studio apartment. He and his wife, you know, and he let me do that, man, you know. So, you know, I got so much love for him. And there's two other people that, that were um, 
very, very gracious and kind to me. Um, when I was playing with Bobby, it was a bass player named Curtis Lundy. And then he had, he told me he had a sister that sang. And her name is Carmen Lundy. And so when she did her gigs, she would call me and put me on, you know, on her gigs. And I learned so much music from them, man. Oh, man. And it was just beautiful. It was just like, you know, they saw, they saw something in me, you know, that's like, okay, he's got something. Let's, let's bring him in and let, let him, let him grow. You know, let him learn, let him grow. You know what I mean? So, so I'm, I'm just grateful. You know, Frank Foster, like I met Frank, it was a jam session at, it was a club called the Jazz Forum down in the village. Yeah. Right. And it was a loft. It was like the end of the loft scene. And, and it was a jam session, and Frank got up to play. So we just played, like, some tunes. And he came, hey, kid, you, you know, you really sound good. Yeah, man, what's your name? Hey, what's your number? Hey, when I get something, I'm going to be sure to call you. Now, this is 1983. So about, about two years later, there was this club called Lush Life. It was right across from the Village Gate, and it was around for a while. And so I went to hear somebody play. And I walk in the club, and there's Kenny Barron. So Kenny comes up to me, and he says, hey, Smitty. Frank Foster's been looking for you. He's putting the back together the two Franks, Frank Foster and Frank West. So uh, Kenny and Rufus Reed were going to play. He said, look, they're doing a new record. He's been looking for you because he wants you to do this record. So, so he got back in touch with me. So I ended up doing this record. Actually, they did two records with the two Franks, and we ended up doing a bunch of gigs for like three and a half years. Then it gets to Benny Golson, yeah. right? So how I got to work with Benny Golson was uh, the Jazz Tet, when they put the Jazz Tet back together with him and our farmer, Curtis Fuller, uh, they were playing a week at Fat Tuesdays. And so, you know, back then, you played six nights, you know, a week, hey, six nights was great. So my big brother, Jabali, Billy Hart, he was playing in the band. And just so happened that the very last night of the gig, the, the last night of the engagement, he had to leave to go to Europe. So now in typical... If you knew Jabali, if you knew Jabali, Jabali waited until the week of the gig to tell the guys, hey, guys, I got to leave the last night to go to Europe. So they weren't quite pleased. But but he said, look, I got this young guy. I got this young cat. You know, he's going to, you know, I gave him the music. He's going to do it. Hey, so I came down one night, check out the gig. Right. And then so that Sunday night, the last night of the gig, I'm there early setting up, you know, got everything ready. You know, like, and I remember we were in the dressing room right before we we're going on. And Art Farmer turns to me and he says, well, young man, um, what would you like to play? You know, because, you know, Benny had all these arrangements, you know. And, and so, you know, Art just figured, we'll just play some standards and get through the night. You know, so he says, like, young man, what would you like to play? I said, uh, I said, um, you know, I said, Art, you know, I'm, I'm here to play you guys music. I came down, checked out the music. I had the music in advance. I listened to it, you know, I, I looked, looked at the charts. I'm ready to play your music. So... Get on the bandstand, play the first tune, reading it down, playing, blah, blah. After we play the first tune, and Art gets on the mic, he says, ladies and gentlemen, this is something I haven't witnessed in quite some time, that here's this young man that just steps in, never worked with us before, never played our music before, you know, and he came in and he was prepared and, you know, played the music and, and it's just really beautiful. He sounds really good and we just, you know, I'm just very proud that, you know, we have young men to come and, you know, so it was great. And, and I remember on the break, I, I went to Benny. I said, Benny, remind me at the end of the night to give you back the drum book with all the music. And he said, and he was like, no, I think I want you to hold that onto that for a while. So I ended up working with the jazz step for like three and a half years. And then I worked in Art Farmer's band out of that. And, you know, it was just a whole thing. So there's just so many people, you know. Uh, that 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 were just a heavy influence, and I would be risk, remiss if I don't mention Kevin Eubanks because, you know, when we all first got to New York and he put his uh, first band together and he called me in, and you know we've been playing together for forty years, and to be able to still look at each other on the bandstand is a blessing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful, right, you know. Right. But all those gigs, like what you were talking about, your story with with Art Farmer and Benny Ghost, it's because you were prepared. It was because you could read. Yeah. You know, so you could handle that situation. And now you have also done, you know, many clinics and you conduct seminars and things like yeah, that. Yeah, master classes. Have, have you have you noticed uh, a pattern among young drummers about what it is that they really are lacking or what they uh, want to learn? Rhonda, again, 
I don't want to be the curmudgeonous kid off my lawn guy. But, um, you know, I remember when I, when I was like trying to learn drum solos, you know, from all the greats. And I remember sitting there with the records and, you know, like, you know, now you young folks out there, you know, there was a time where you had this thing called a record player or a turntable. And there was this thing called vinyl. <laughs> and that's how music was made on these wax vinyl things. And you put, you know, you put it on this, uh, you know, arm that had a needle and it would play the music. And and then there was a, the long play disc was 33 and one third revolutions per minute. And then they actually had where you could do 16 revolutions and it would sound an octave lower and a lot slower and it sounded weird in anything. But so when I, you know, trying to learn some of the drum solos where I actually slowed it down to like 16 and, you know, you're just hearing everything real slow, but you're trying to figure out how they, you know, the sticking and, you know, where, which drum they put it or which symbol and you do that. Right. So now, you you know, now we got today, you got YouTube, you got uh, Spotify, uh, uh, Apple Music, you got all this, all these resources and access to all this information. These young folks have it so great right now. They can access anything and everything. And when I do these master class classes or, you know, like a private, you know, and I'm okay, well, you know, who do you listen to? Well, well, you know, I just kind of listen to this one guy and, you know, and, and I only listen to like, you know, a couple of records and, I'm like, I look, I don't, everybody starts somewhere. Okay, I get that. But I'm like, okay, you're wanting to learn how to play music, but you're limiting your resources. How long you been playing? Oh, I've been playing for like, you know, six, seven years, whatever. You know, and in that time, you haven't listened to like... Well, who oh, specifically this, would you say... People should listen to young drummers, inspiring oh. young drummers. Who should they listen to? Well, yeah, because when you start, in, you know, when you when we talk about modern jazz, you know, the, the modern jazz lexicon, so to speak, I would always start with, you know, the, the 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 the, you know, the innovators of the what we term as modern jazz, yeah, which would be Kenny Clark, Max Roach, Art Blakey. That's a great place to start. To me, that's a real foundation. The essence of the swing for drummers. Get to that. Get to that. And if you want to go, you want to go a generation back, check out Papa Joe Jones. Check out Big Sick Catlin. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that's a good place yeah, to start. Yeah, because there's an emphasis on, on right. moving the music forward. But right. as I say, you can't... But you got to have a foundation. You have to know where you've been. You don't. You can't right. tell where you're going until you know where you've right. been. So it's important to check out the people who went before. Right, exactly. Right. Well, you got to have a foundation. Right. You know, like, because cause like a lot of young cats, uh, you know, they want to try to be so ultra and super slick, you know, they want to try to play all across the bar line. They want to try to, you know, play all this, you know, extravagant, you know, extra stuff. But, like, when it's time to just get down and swing, ain't nothing there. You know, and I'm like, you got you to gotta have a foundation. You can't build a house from the roof down. You got to have, you got to lay the foundation first. And that's why I try to, I try to tell everybody that. Horn players, whatever, you know, bass players, you know, drum, you know, you got to have your foundation. You gotta under you gotta make the music swing first before you can start trying to fly and stretch it out and take that you know take that dimension you know but you gotta give the essence of what the music's about first mm -hmm. and, and and I would tell anybody whether it's a drummer or anybody you gotta know how to play the blues because if you don't know how to play the blues you ain't playing this music the blues is the essence of what this music's about mm -hmm. you gotta get to the blues and I mean you know like. Play, you know, like, and I'm not talking about y'all trying to be sweet, like, you know, just like play some, you know, Delta Swamp gut bucket. Give me some Robert Johnson, some Bessie Smith, you know, some Blind Lemon Jeff, you know, like, boom, doom, 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 you know, get into there. You know what I mean? Like, get to the root, you know, and understand what that's about, man, because there's a whole spirit that's behind that, which, which, you know, comes from. You know the you know the lineage and, and foundation of you know African American people. You know that's how we survived in this and when we got to this land. You know through our spirit, you know our spiritual essence. You know that you know helped us persevere and survive even the most you know heinous of conditions. You know and that translated into you know the field holler and and into you know gospel music. You know 
And then it turned into the blues. And then it turned into, you know, no on a swing. And then it turned into the swinger. And then it turned into, you know, bebop and all this. You know what I mean? So they got to understand the blues first before you can do anything else. <laughs> do you still do you still practice? I mean, what, oh, is your, yeah. what is your routine? Yeah, my routine, you know, now my practice room is looking at me sometimes and be like, bro, bro, dog, dog, we here, dog, dog, we here. Like, bro, it's been a couple days, like, dog. No, you know, but when I go in, still to this day, I, I have like this cheesy, like play along program, um, you know, that's on the computer, you know, and, and all I do, like I program like a bunch of standard songs, you know, standard jazz tunes. And still to this day, I just, I just like click on tunes and play different temples. I'm just working on my time. I'm just still working on my time to just keep solid time. And, 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 and keep hearing song forms so that, you know, so I'm hearing the song forms. I know the changes and, it, but, you know, just maintaining, working on my time just to keep solid time. So that's still like a foundational thing for me, mm -hmm. you know, because that's what I do. That's my job. Yeah. See, I studied composition when I was in high school. So I started writing these little tunes, you know, trying to write these little melodies. They're a little corny, but hey, it was a start, you know. So that's how I got in it because I, I really wanted to know you know, how do you create the sound? How, how do you create this mood in terms of composition? You know, when, when I got to Berkeley College, you know, it just kind of developed more and I was trying to write more. And then when I got to New York, you know, I just kind of had, I was writing some music, but I, I kept it buried. But it was until like, I did this record. Uh, I did a trio record with uh, George Shearing and Ray Brown called uh, Breaking Out the Blues. It was for Concord Records. And it was during that session where Bray Brown asked me, he said, hey, Smitty, um, you got any music of your own you've been writing? And I said, oh, yeah, Ray, I got, I got some music. So it was through Ray Brown that he hooked me up with my record deal. So I ended up doing my two solo records with uh, Concord Records. Okay. Oh, anyway. But that was Keeper of the Drums. Pre Keeper of the Drums and The Road Less that, Travel. How did you come up with that title, though? Keeper no, that was, Carl. Was, that was Carl. That was Carl's uh -huh. idea. Uh -huh. I, wanted to, I wanted to call it just have fun because I wrote a tune. The first tune on the record is called Just Have Fun. Mm -hmm. oh, you know, he had the bright idea. Like, yeah, I keep her the drums. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> you know? But you are. You are the keeper of the drums in many ways because you are passing on all of this tradition that, that you learned from the great masters, the great legends that yeah. you had the opportunity to learn from. Yeah. And, you know, it's great. having had so many great experiences, how would you say this music has really... Uh, enhanced your life? You know, the process of creating jazz, how does that relate to life? What lessons have you learned oh. that have, you know, helped you deal with the journey that we all have to go through in life? Well, you know, music was, music was like a sanctuary for me, you know, uh, because it, 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 it gave me life it, and it showed me light, you know, in some darkness, you know, and, you know, it, when I, it, when I was a kid. So, so the music was, was the way for me to, you know, to feel empowered and, and to, and, and, and to uh, aspire to greatness because, you know, these, these guys that I was reading the liner notes on the back of these records, you know, like, you know, Charlie Parker, you know, Miles Davis, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, and Sonny Rollins, and, you know, like these, and I was just like, man, these cats are great. You know, I just want to be, I just want to be great. I just want to get on their level. You know, I just wanted to, you know, just be on that level where I can have some impact and, and really like bring something to the music and just have that kind of impact, you know, where where I can make a statement. It, it gave me a sense of discipline too, you know, like in order to be, in order to be on that level, okay, then I, I gotta handle my business. I gotta, I gotta get in the shed. I gotta really work this out. I got, I, you know, and I have to be dedicated. And, and, you know, and really put the time in and, and really, you know, be serious about what this music is about, you know, and, you know, and it wasn't just the people, but it was the lives that they were living, you know, and I, when I stopped to think, like when I got to New York and I started playing with some of these legends and, you know, like, so the bebop era cats were one thing, you know, like I, you know, I had the great fortune to talk to Max. Max Roach, you know, Art Blakey, you talk to Elvin, you know, talk to some of the, you know, other guys and hear their stories of how they were on the scene and, you know, traveling on the road. And then when I got to play with some of the swing era guys, you know, uh, the judge, Milt Hinton, 
I played, I got to play with Slam Stewart, you know. I mean, you know, like I used to see Doc Cheatham. He would play on every Sunday at Sweet Basil's, like the, mat the matinee, yeah. you know, afternoon gig, you know. And he was already like in his 80s you know, or 70s then, you know, back then. And, you know, and talking with some of the swing era guys and even what they went through, you know, and how they were traveling on train. And I mean, in the, in the height of Jim Crow segregation and like where, you know, they had to travel, you know, sundown towns, and, you know, and they had to stay, you know, they had to find places to stay overnight, you know, so they, you know, stand with people, you know, strangers, you know, but they would, you know, take them in and then, they, you know, traveling on bus or train to get to the next city and, oh man, you know, you think about that and, you know, you think about what those people sacrificed in order to create this art and, and create it on a high level and the amount of dedication that it took despite all the conditions, the vicissitudes of, of, you know, society that was happening for them back then, for them to still create this high level of art, despite all that, man, I ain't got jack to complain about, man. You know, compared to what they had to go through to make this music, man, let me sit down and shut up and get in the shed and work this out, man, and represent for them, you know? because they made the sacrifice for guys like me. You know what I mean? So it means, a, this music means a lot. You know, so I learned like, hey, they're, they're, you know, there's a certain level of pride and dignity that this music, you know, represents. You know, this is just not just some, you know, casual, you know, thing, you know, and it's not just something that's dismissive, even though maybe society may be dismissive and has dismissed it for a long time, you know, because at first it was just looked at, well, you know, this is just some, yeah, this is some low level, you know, crass stuff, you know, and, you know, but then it's like, hey, it, it, you know, you can't stop something that's just like genuine and so spiritually strong that, that it just, it's a light. You can't contain light like that. The light just shines so bright, you know, you, it's gotta be seen, you know what I mean? So this music represents so much in the people that have really dedicated their lives to it and represented it, you know, in such a, a, a dignified manner and, and put it on such a high level, it commands respect, you know, and it, it cannot be denied, you know. Now I look at, you know, like now we're here under the auspices of, you know, my big sister, Carmen, Carmen Lundy, you know, and I'm telling you, now I just have to say this because, you know, and there's, you know, there's a lot of singers, you know, there's singers on the scene now, and, you know, hey, I'm rooting for folks. I'm rooting for folks to make it and to make this music, you know, represent on the highest level it is. But if you're going to talk to me, pound for pound, my big sis, Carmen Lundy, she's the baddest out here. And they ain't showing her the proper love, man. They are not showing her the proper love. Like, she's an original. Like, you know, anybody can sing these, these standards. We don't warn these standards. I, I ain't got nothing new to say on those standards. So, you know, I'll be, you know, but here's, I mean, even back in the day, you know, back in our New York days, she already had a vision. She was already writing original music back then and she was doing it and she was getting it done. And she was presenting her concept and she was pre presenting her, her spirit and everything. She was presenting it back then, you know, I, and, and, to see that now still, and that's still strong, and it's still got weight, and I mean, like, and people don't really know. I mean, you know, they, they you know, like the, 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 the machine that is, you know, promotes a certain thing because they like to control the narrative and all that, and then, okay, all right, whatever, but, but I know, pound for pound, big sis, Carmen Lunny, she's the baddest out here, man, and they, they need to show her love. They need to show her the right kind of love. You know, because she's getting it done. And she's still doing it. And it's still strong. And it, and it has a spirit. And, and, and it's, it's everything that embodies what this country's supposed to be about. You know, you know, it's, it's, it's original, man. And it's strong. And it's, it's got, you know, it's got a great spirit to it. And, like, people need to recognize people like her. And, and several others that are out here. But, you know, the, you know, the machine is, is what it is. But they can't stop that light, though. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I, I, the, the music it speaks to so many people all over the world, as you certainly experienced yeah. Yeah. in your travels. You know, and artists like Harmon Lundy and like yourself, they have that 
foundation, you know, and, yeah. and I think that's the message that you're you're trying to give to young artists out here. You know, go on your journey, but but have that foundation because that's how you build and that's how you create something that is of value. Right. Yeah. Now, now see, here's a lesson I learned when I got to New York. When I was a kid, see, I'm a radio kid. I listened to the radio growing up, so I heard everything. I heard. I heard that I heard James Brown, I heard Motown, Sly and the Family Stone, you know, Graham Central Station. I heard, you know, I heard Hendrix. I heard, you know, like, you know, Beatles and Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin. I heard all that. Of course, you know, because of, you know, my dad mainly was, you know, I heard jazz. So I heard Charlie Parker and Miles and, you know, Dizzy and, you know, Coltrane and, you know, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, you know, so. I was into all of that. See, it was just all music to me. I wasn't delineating, you know, compartmentalizing, you know. It was just all music, you know. So I was it. But when I got to New York, then I saw this hard divide, you know. So, you know, so, you know, and, and it's generational. I, and I get that too, you know, because like, you know, the bebop generation, you know, it, you know, and then we like, you know, some of the cats, a lot of the cats were very hardcore. Like, man, I don't, you know, because rap was just coming it you know it, into fruition and you know, oh, that rap stuff yeah I don't listen to that. you know so they were going a rant with that you know and I'm like okay but I would play R and B gigs uptown you know there was a club called Mikel's oh, yeah. that was up you know up, you know Upper West Side and then across from it it was uh, I just never bought into like the whole se separation and division right. aspect of, 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 of the music yeah. so I tell young cats now I see some young bloods uh, out on the scene now, you know because they come from hip hop. You know, and I'm like, I'm saying, I'm, I'm telling these guys, I'm like, look, man, embrace where you come from. Look, we all have a starting point of how we got into jazz, how we got into this music. So we all have a starting point, but it's just up to us to keep digging and doing the research and the homework. You know, but but I never forsook w w what generation I came from, because I came from rock and roll. You know, I'm the last of the baby boomers, but. But I, you know, I grew up in rock and roll and funk and soul, and mm -hmm. so I didn't, I didn't abandon that. I embraced that. I was like, let me take this and okay, I'm gonna try to throw this, mix this in with the swing, and you know, come up with something. You know what I mean? So that I just encourage the young cats, embrace where you come from and incorporate that into the foundation of the music, and you know, find your own voice. Yeah. And, and, and express yourself. And a lot of the hip hop guys pay a lot of attention to jazz, though. I mean, they right. do listen to jazz. They get inspiration from yeah from the jazz artists. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what I would, what I really idealistically would ho hope to have happen is that you know, like the hip hop or rap artists will be able to come together, and and the jazz artists be able to really come together and collaborate and create a new musical sound. You know what I mean? Because, okay, you know, like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, putting down, you know, hip hop or rap artists, you know, but, you know, 90, probably, I would, I think it would be fair to say 99% of them don't know a C natural if it slapped them upside no, the head. They don't know music. You know, they don't know music. They don't know the formal understanding of music. And then you have, you know, musicians who actually study, you know, they study jazz and they have good sensibility and foundation, but then they kind of look down on these cats, you know, like, it's like, Okay, you know, now, you know, with, with a lot of the rap artists, they, they could kind of read more literature and poetry and maybe get a dictionary and a thesaurus to, you know, be able to express themselves with some, you know, more, you know, more words and stuff. But, but you know, I, I think if, they, you know, if there was a real collaboration, I, you know, like what, like Robert Glasper, he's out there trying to do it. Terrace Martin, you know, he's out there. Uh, you know, the group uh, with uh, Robert Glasper, you know, Kareem Riggins and Common. I, I forget the name of that their group, group. They did a record, you know. So, I mean, there's they, they've been starting to do some of that. And I just hope more of that happens, you know, where it can really just have a new, a new sound expression where it really embraces all of those, you know, sensibilities. Well, I have a, I have a group. I call it the BMD, Black Music Diaspora. My, my two solo records, it was a, it was a seven piece band. It was four horns and rhythm section. Now with the BMD, I got a nine piece band because I added a guitar and a percussionist. <laughs> so you know, nine piece band. Good luck trying to get work with that big of an ensemble. But I, but the thing is, I believe in it, you know, because that's the sound I'm hearing. So I'm trying to incorporate, like I say, the black music diaspora from you know from you know from you know swing 
We just swing, you know, you got some funk, you got a little fusion in there, you know, you try to, I, I try to get into, you know, Afro beats, you know, where, you know, where, you know, from the motherland or whatever, you know, and, you know, uh, you know, Afro-Cuban, you know, and Latin jazz, I try to incorporate that. So I'm just trying to write things where I'm trying to incorporate all of the aspect of the diaspora of the music from our people, you know, so it's just a vision I have and hopefully I can just keep going and keep writing to, to, to really fulfill that vision. <laughs> well, thank you for spending so much time with us today. Uh, it was uh, just a joy listening to all your stories uh, and experiencing your energy. Uh, and we look forward to hearing BMD. Yeah, BMB. yeah the, the BMD, diaspora. Black Music yes, Diaspora. We, yes. got it. we got our performance next month uh, in Santa Monica College. And I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I, st I was trying to write a couple of new arrangements, so I'm trying to spit them out. So, you know, we have some, like a couple of new songs to play. But, you know, but it's great. But I tell you, this is great. It's so good to see you, Rhonda. It's good just to been way you. too long. And, and, and I'm so happy and proud of, of all the work that you've done over the years because you are our, our ambassador for the music. And uh, you're just as important as you know me or any other any of the other musicians that make this music but you make it in terms of presenting it to the masses so we you know me personally i appreciate all the work that you've done and continue to do and i wish you all the best in in your future endeavors in that and congratulations on the serious xm show oh appreciate well you. well thank you but it's so important and i couldn't do what i do without what you do and what carmen lundy does and all of the great artists because I love the music, and I think if you present it in a certain way, people can't do anything else but love the yeah. music, because that's what it's all about. Yeah, and, and the music is, is, is really about, you know, you know spreading that joy right. and, and really showing love to everybody, you know. And I, I want to leave this last thing, you know. And, and as, as I've gotten older and, um, you know, I think about this, and I think about the, where the society is now, and it's, it's just even more important than ever that we, we, we really, you know, cherish uh, the music and cherish the people that, that create this music. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to really appreciate more, you know, the moments that I have on the bandstand with the people I make music with, you know, because, uh, you know, things are finite, <laughs> you know, our lives are finite. Yeah. And, and, you know, and at this stage in my career, because it's kind of, you know, the sun is starting to gradually set. And now, it, it, you know, I'm trying to really make a statement, you know, for the last portion of my career to, to really leave a legacy where, you know, okay, well, you know, people can see what I've done and say, well, you know, hey, this guy really did something and, and it holds up. And, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's something we can learn from to take the music further to the next stage. You know, and I also want to say, you know, because I, I, I look at my big sister, Carmen, and, you know, and I think about Carmen, you know, Terry Lynn Carrington, you know, you know, Jerry Allen, rest in peace. And so many other, you know, I also, I just want to make a statement about the women that have helped to make this music what it is. You know, Mary Lou Williams, Melba Liston, you know, Bessie Smith, you know. Ella, you know, uh, Carmen McRae, Nancy Wilson, you know, Billie Holiday, you know, it's so many, you know, Vi Red, uh, Clara Bryant, who just recently passed away, you know, and all the women that have helped shape this music too. And if you could ever imagine what the music could sound like without racism, without misogyny, without homophobia, you know, without all that, imagine what, how powerful, even more powerful this music could be without all that. You know, so I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, this music represents a real like agape love, if you will, you know, because we just embrace it's about embracing people's humanity. And we got to get back to that. We got to really embrace people's humanity and acknowledge, recognize and respect their being, you know, and that's going to help make the music strong. It's important. We really need to get back to that consciousness. Well, the whole concept of jazz is, is having the opportunity to express yourself as an individual. Mm -hmm. You have that opportunity when you have your solo, when you improvise. Right. But at the same time, as a group, you have to all listen to each other and you right. have to respect each other. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and it's and 
hey, all for one and one for all. That's what it's about. Thank you again. Oh, Lawrence thank you. Smitty Ron. Smith, our guest today on Living the Jazz Life. I'm Rhonda Hamilton. I hope you'll join us again next time. Thank you.